All right, everyone. Hello. So welcome. Today is day 24 of I hope you're all doing well. I'm doing fine over here. I tried to give myself a uh, you know, quarantine haircut and that went all right. But I hope you're all enjoying yourselves, even as we can't see each other anyway. But we do what we can. So today is day 24. What we are going to do is, that, as I said, we are going to be talking about DNA today. Specifically, we're going to talk about kind of what it is, how it's used in forensics, of what impact has DNA had on forensics recently, and talking especially about this piece of evidence and how this piece of evidence really makes a difference in forensics in this day and age. Now, homework-wise, uh, you know that due by the end of the day, Wednesday is going to be your skeletal lab. I'm just hoping, because again, you have Easter break coming up, that you have everything finished before that. And then by the end of the day, or end of next week, what we are going to be doing is that at the end of this lesson, I'm going to be giving you, as you said, some famous cases. And I just want you to first just look, research, and I'll have a couple of instructions for you in order to figure out exactly how you can go and how you can find out what pieces of information I'm hoping for you to have with those cases. But let's get started. So DNA, hopefully you've all talked about it at some point in time in your classes before, especially biology. Now, there are first, I'm going to show you a timeline of DNA, and I know it's controversial, but it is here. So DNA started out in 1953 with James Watson and Francis Crick. And again, yes, I do have Rosalind Franklin over here too, and we can have that debate all day that you want, but as of right now, still attributed to Watson and Crick. Then you have Ray White, who determines the first RFLP marker, Alec Jeffries, Kerry Mullis, FBI starts with data casework. But here's what I want and why I showed you this. Notice the dates of all of these discoveries of specifically 1988 is the first time that the FBI starts using DNA in its casework. And I want you to think of what a change that has been in forensics recently in like, oh gosh, that's 30 years ago. But in the past 30 years and how many crimes or cases there could have been before that time that DNA made a real, really big impact on. So that's where we start out. Now, DNA, we need to go over just a couple of just basic things with DNA. First off, DNA is composed as a double helix of it looks like, again, this image over on the side here, and it just has different bases, specifically four bases. Now, a part of DNA is that most of the time, 99.9% .9 in humans, the order of these bases are always the same. And it's always adenine to thymine and guanine to cytosine. It's always the exact same pairings every single time. But these are your four main bases. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to match how these bases interact and how they match with each other. That's the main idea with DNA. Now, DNA is found in every single nucleated just cell in general. So that could be white blood cells, semen, saliva, urine, hair, teeth, bone, tissue, doesn't matter. Anything that has a nucleus you can get DNA from. Now, DNA is really, really important because some of the things my students always go and they have to think is that red blood cells have no nucleus. You cannot actually take DNA from red blood cells itself. But if you have blood, you go and you can take the DNA from the white blood cells and still you're fine. But anything that has a nucleus, you can take DNA from. Now, with DNA, you're trying to figure out how that DNA differs in forensics to other people. We can go all into how it pairs and the energy. No, but we're talking specifically of how does my DNA differ from someone else's DNA so that if they find DNA at a crime scene, they can go and they can determine the exact person that that DNA came from. That's the main idea. So what they're going to do is that DNA DNA typing in general, they're trying to figure out the differences between one person and another. That's the main idea. And the way in which we first start out here is that DNA, for the most part, is really, really, really common in lots and lots of things. Of Specifically in humans, it says 97% is non-coding. It's just the same sequence over and over and over and over again. And if you think about it, this is actually of like 
the proteins and if we look at like the proteins it's specifically smaller than like the actual genes itself so if you think of three percent of proteins and then these proteins the exact same 97 percent you get things like this all the time with dna of like little infographics the genetic similarity between a human and a cat is yeah of course it is it's repetitive it does the exact same thing time after time after time after time after time so if you're thinking of if you're trying to figure out the differences in proteins itself and proteins are only three percent and then 97 percent of that three percent you're looking for a very 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 small minute difference between people and this is where it really really becomes kind of a challenge so dna most of the time is to identify suspects to exonerate individuals to identify crime to establish paternity to match organ donor all of these fall specifically within the realm of forensics and you might be thinking to yourself well why in the world is like the fbi caring about paternity or caring about organ donors something of the sort there and we'll get into that a little bit later, but you have to think all of these fall within the same realm. This is the main idea. Now, DNA and DNA typing has three specific parts that I need you to know. The first one is RFLP, which is Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. The second one is PCR, which is Polymerase Chain Reaction. And then finally is STR, Short Tandem Repeats. And we're going to go through each one of these and kind of describe what they are and how they're used in order to figure out and type the DNA from person to person. So what we want to do first is let's start out with RFLP. RFLP is Restriction Fragment Length pol uh, Polymorphism. I have to look at it every single time I say it. But all that RFLP is used to do is that you want to find that very, very small specific section of DNA in a like uh, crime scene to begin with. So what they do is that they find DNA, they take the DNA from the nucleus of any nucleated cell, and they perform RFLP, which is a way in which for them to fragment and to cut and to isolate the DNA. Now, I want you to think, if you have one drop of blood, yeah, fine, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of cells in there, you know that. But also, it can be really, really difficult, and if you're going and you're using chemicals on this drop of blood, then there has to be a way for you to figure out exactly how you can analyze these lengths for RFLP. So, what that is, is it's PCR. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it's a way, specifically, you give it like a nice water bath basically and it's a way for you to go and to replicate dna a pcr and specifically dna typing would not be possible without a pcr machine there's no way so if you notice in 1985 it's karen mulis who goes and develops a pcr test you could not test DNA before this point because you only had a single strand, and that's nowhere near enough to go and to actually test and figure out DNA. So what they do is that they first cut it through RFLP, then they multiply this DNA time after time after time, and every single time it just goes and it matches it half and half. And what I mean by that is that the DNA literally splits, you add a primer, and with this primer, you go and it doubles the amount of DNA every single time that you put it through a PCR machine. So if you have one, then you have two, and two, four, four, you know, eight, eight, 16, the entire way. But they usually do it 25 to 30 times. And by the end of it, you have millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of copies of DNA in this specific molecule. And it takes no time at all. It's shocking how little time this takes. So what ends up happening all the time is that they go and they cut it through RFLP. They multiply it however many times they need. There is no such thing as a shortage of DNA molecules in this day and age anymore. And then they test it. And the way in which they started out testing it is that first off, with like PCR, there's lots of advantages and disadvantages, but they test it through electrophoresis. And specifically, Jill or gel electrophoresis is a way for them to figure out the specific like DNA. So what happens in gel electrophoresis, hopefully some of you have done this before. I know Mr. Kinsting does a lab with gel electrophoresis, but you go and you take your specific DNA inside of, these are just the PCR tubes, 
you put them into a micro pipette and then you load them into gel and you have to be very very careful not to actually like break the gel walls here because then you're going to have this and basically what the dna does is that the dna then goes and it runs is what it's called so what ends up happening is that the heavier like pieces of DNA, the more sectioned pieces of DNA, are going to stay near the gel like just well to begin with. And then the lighter pieces of DNA, because it's going to take less energy, are running and they're going to go further and further and further down this gel block. So you go and you get a visualization of what DNA is in that sample and based off of the PCR and how many times you've replicated it, you can go and you can get a match. These types of images for DNA are oh so very popular all the time. And you can see that this is just a gel. And again, this is after a marker and everything here. But because the specific DNA here, 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 and then at the very, very end here, all of these people are related because you see how the DNA is matched up between all of them. This is again just the sizes and the masses of this DNA and they're being used to match it. Now this is how they started out with DNA and how it's by far the easiest way to just hear or determine the match between DNA. You see this all the time but this is in gel blocks and I want you to think just pause the video for a second and think of a problem of using DNA through gel blocks all right so pause Okay, so what in the world is the problem between using DNA and gel blocks and not something else? How in the world are you going to code or are you going to figure out how many gel blocks, how many cases of DNA do you think that there are? The problem is, is what? Are you going to take a photo of this every single time? Are you going to have a big old room somewhere or just a mass storage of every single gel block you've used for electrophoresis? And the answer is no, absolutely. There has to be a better way. So what they did is that eventually they came up with STR. STR stands for short tandem repeats. And it's a really like over my head complicated way of going and analyzing DNA. But the entire point of STR is to digitize the DNA. So let's talk a little bit about what STR is and how they're going to kind of use STR because STR is by far now the most prevalent way of typing DNA in this day and age. So what they are doing is that they go and they're going to just sequence the DNA based off this like locations, the loci of specific chromosome. So what they do is they go and they look and they usually start out with 13 different chromosomal positions and they're trying to match these chromosomal positions with others through STR. And most of the time, this gene, TH01, is by far the easiest and the best means for them to do it. Then they amplify the DNA, they sort it through electrophoresis again, and they determine the distance between. And it's those distances that then those are values, those are digital numbers that they can go and they can use. So every single person has one, you know, THO1 gene from each parent, meaning, because we're going to talk about types of DNA, there's no way in which you can escape a STR test. Like it comes from mother, it comes from father. Every single time does not matter. So what they do is that they go and then they digitize it. And then it's shown on peaks of a graph. And you can see exactly how the peaks of a graph, and this is all the time, of those different genes being plotted and digitized in order to figure out a match. Now, if you go and you try to figure out like a match between people, they're going, they're trying to figure out just the probability of having a match with others. And you should obviously no. If I asked just our class by itself, what is by far the most telling thing in a crime scene, how many of you would say DNA? Of If they got your DNA at a crime scene on the victim, on whatever, then more than likely you're kind of out of luck. DNA is really, really telling, and the probability that someone matches a DNA is almost zero. 
if they find DNA and they match it correctly using STR, you're kind of out of luck. Again, it's a really, really accurate method of working. Now, STR, again, deals with chromosomes, it deals with alleles, it deals with lots and lots of different things. And if you want to see, I go and I found this you know, animation that does such a great job of describing it to you. But I would really go and encourage you to go to this specific site and just go through their STR demonstration. It really, really works out well. But the three types, again, of that you need to know are RFLP, it's how they cut and specifically just section off that piece of DNA. PCR is how they amplify that DNA and multiply it time after time after time. And then finally, STR is how they digitize that DNA from those gel electrophoresis blocks. That's the main idea with all of this. Now, what we want to do is that eventually they test the DNA. And whenever they test the DNA, their next thing is to say, okay, what could happen? There's three different possibilities and three different outcomes. Either A, the DNA is a match, B, the DNA is not a match, or C, the data is inconclusive, obviously. Now, a lot of the time, you have to go and you have to determine not just match exclusion or inconclusive, but how well of a match it could be. Again, we're looking at specific genes and how many genes and how many you know spots on that DNA match between others will give you a greater accuracy. So what they do is that first off, you need to know that there's two different types of DNA. There is nuclear and there is mitochondrial DNA. Of nuclear, DNA is found in the nucleus and it's in every single nucleus. It comes from both parents. Like nuclear DNA is the end all be all. Mitochondrial DNA actually is really, really interesting, though, because it's only inherited through the mothers. It is a single lineage throughout the entire thing. And nuclear, or sorry, mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA can be used in different applications, trying to figure out exactly how that DNA and what type of DNA you are going to test for. Now, me, I was going and I was like, why in the world are there two different types of DNA? I always only ever thought of one type of DNA whenever I was learning it. But the idea is that I went and I did some research and the nuclear DNA is present on the head of the sperm and the mitochondrial DNA is present in the tail of the sperm. So whenever the sperm enters the egg, then the sperm loses its tail and therefore you've lost the mitochondrial or you've lost the father's mitochondrial DNA. It's really, really fascinating how this works, but this is the main idea. Now, some differences between the two is that first off, you need to know that the nuclear and the mitochondrial DNA is used all the time. Some of you probably have had like a Ancestry.com test and they're becoming very, very famous and very, very popular. Now, what I want to talk about is that, again, these types of things, they've been used. This is actually like a case of, uh, it was the Golden State Killer was their moniker, but it was a person who was just by itself free for many, many years. And eventually, like it was... I think that his niece, someone of the sort, went and tested themselves through this ancestry DNA, and they figured out that this DNA matches based off of two specific family trees just based off of this databank. So if you have one family tree going up this way and then the other one went and, you know, went through the other family tree, then they could figure out who's the match between the two family trees and specifically who is the suspect for this case. It's a really fascinating and just recent development in forensics to try and figure out how these, you know, people can be matched through DNA. But mitochondrial DNA, unfortunately, is much more expensive, much more time consuming, and much, much more difficult to try to test in the very, very end. So really, mitochondrial DNA is our second like choice. You use nuclear DNA just about every single time that you can. But if for some reason the nuclear DNA is not prevalent enough or not present or whatever in the world you have, then again, mitochondrial DNA is another type of like answer that you could use then for the very, very end. Now, whenever you get the STR, the short tandem repeats, this is the reason why 
that DNA is so prevalent and so popular in today is that, do you remember APHIS? It's the fingerprint system. Again, they have something called CODIS, and it's the Combined DNA Index System. So what they do is that if you have your DNA tested, they go and they place it into CODIS. And CODIS is going to go, and it was first launch of October of 1998. I was five years old by that age. Literally, CODIS has been a thing less time than I have been alive. So what CODIS does is it's the database, and it takes either four ROF LP markers or 13 core STR markers in order to get a match. With 13 STR markers, there is absolutely no way that if someone has those 13 markers matching that there's not any chance that they're not the person. But this is the reason why, like I was going and talking about at the very, very beginning, that it's used to establish paternity or to match organ donors. Like forensic anthropology through DNA is so much more than just matching cases because of CODIS. It's this big database for everything and everyone and every piece of DNA that they have ever collected for this time. So this is our main idea. Now, I keep on bringing up these dates, 1998, 1985, 1988, every single time, because one of the main things is that if CODIS was launched in 1998, I want you to start thinking about exactly how many people have been released or exonerated because of DNA evidence, that every single time, like it's famous in this day and age, specifically because you think of all of the cases and just the change in technology throughout all of it. And it's, again, so prevalent in this day and age, it seems ridiculous not to go and to figure out and to use this information to test others. So in this opportunity, in this hope, here's what I'm going to assign for you. And it's just going to be some famous DNA case studies of Every single one of these seven cases that you see right here, all are solved or figured out through DNA or something in this case is very, very, very famous through the usage of DNA. So here's what I want you to do. I just want you to research a little bit and we're gonna use this for ammo. Of specifically, I want you to describe the case. How did DNA impact the case? So what exactly did DNA do for this case at the very end? I want you to figure out what type of DNA analysis was used. So this could be nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA. Now, you might not DNA. You might not find exactly what type of DNA was used, but I'm just again wanting you to preface and try to think how has DNA changed over the years? And specifically, here's the idea. I want you to figure out how the case was changed through the use of this DNA. Now, I know that these two questions can go and they can be a little bit conjunctive. And what I mean, they intersect with each other a little bit and that's okay. But specifically, I want you to think here of DNA impacting the case itself. I think about the crime of how did forensically that crime occur and what did DNA do for that crime? And then here, this is really verdict. I think of this more judicial, more legal of did they get another repeal? Were they exonerated? Were they acquitted? Were they convicted? What exactly happened because of this DNA? Now, I'm thinking to answer these four questions in like an accurate manner is about one page double spaced, give or take. Now, am I going to be a real, real big stickler on one page double spaced? And I mean by like, oh my gosh, they missed two lines at the bottom. No, goodness, no. I don't have a word count because this is a science class and I want you to focus on the content more so than the fluff at the very, very end. But my idea also is that if you go double spaced, that's like half a page, come on, two paragraphs, something of the sort. If you go at the very, very end and you're like, oh my gosh, I answered my four questions, but I only used half a sentence for each and my entire thing fills up you know, that much on the computer, then you're not doing it in enough detail that I'm hoping for. So is this like a hard cutoff? No, but should it be around this length? Yeah, absolutely. 
And again, make it something normal. Don't change it to size 36 font, for goodness sake. But here's the main idea. Now, I've already posted an assignment on Canvas for this. And again, this is going to be due at the end of next week because we have something really, really fun coming up. Next time, specifically, we're done with our third unit of... If we were still in session and like normal classes, you would have your review and then your test after this. But we're going on to our fourth unit, and our fourth unit is criminal psychology. Now, what I always start out with is I start out with criminal profiling to begin with. And criminal profiling is the one thing in criminal psychology, all of you have seen Criminal Minds at some point in time, I'm sure, have heard or Mind Hunter on Netflix, whatever in the world. And it's a really, really popular topic. But criminal profiling comes into use and it comes into prevalence whenever you have lots and lots of differing ideas. So that is going to be nigh impossible for me to adequately teach and to teach it in the manner in which you and I are both going to enjoy it by just myself talking to my computer screen. So what I'm going to do is that this is going to be our very, very first full class Zoom session of what it is is that next Wednesday, next Thursday, during your specific block for your class, I think my B class is in the morning, and I'm unfortunately pretty sure my E class is too. But I'll see you in the morning, and we'll talk about criminal profiling. Now, I know that we've done one Zoom session before, but not everyone has been able to make it. Unfortunately, this is one of those ones that if you can't make it for some reason, just let me know of... I don't want to have to keep attendance as in like, oh, you're required to be, but this is not going to go well. I am going to go and give you points based off of this discussion, but it's not going to go well if everyone overslept at the end. So if you can't make it for some reason, you know, just let me know, email me, do something of the sort, but this is our meeting ID. So at the very, very end on that day, you'll wake up. I'm sure roll out of bed, go to your desk somewhere wherever you're doing all of your schoolwork, and then meet us for the Zoom session. That's our main idea. But everyone, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Again, this is kind of where we're going from here on out. I hope everyone's safe. And of course, I miss you all. See you, everyone.